Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to continue along with our broad narrative, uh, really coming toward the close of our broad narrative of American history. Um, uh, we're picking up with the, uh, with the end of the Reagan administration, but before we, we uh, begin our lecture proper, I just like to do our customary recap and touch bases on what we last discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture, we were looking at, we were concluding really, the uh, in our last series of lectures, I should say, we were discussing and then uh, concluding African Americans uh, after 1970. Uh, we looked at the rise of African American politicians, men such as Marion Barry, um, Harold Washington, David Dinkins, um, uh, men who um, achieved uh, mayoralties in the uh, in some of the nation's major cities. We also looked at the rise of uh, African Americans in the halls of Congress. Um, we examined the first, second, third, and fourth wave waves of uh, politicians, and we also looked at um, the rise of African American conservatives who in the late 70s and uh, 1980s uh, gained the prominence uh, not really before seen. Um, we noted that uh, up until the 1980s, most African Americans on the, uh, on the national level had been outspoken supporters of progressive and liberal policies, um, mainly because uh, at the time the entire community was involved in the struggle for civil rights and the struggle to overcome uh, very real uh, national problems, uh, na national institutions, or or uh, ingrained ways of thinking, such as um, chattel slavery and, uh, of course, uh, Jim Crow racial segregation. Now, uh, with that being said, I'd like to dive right into our our uh, lecture topics for today. And for today, I want to look at the. Uh, I want to begin by saying that after the end of the Reagan administration, Ronald Reagan's presidency, his vice president, uh, through his two terms, uh, Reagan won uh, two elections. He won in 19, uh, uh, 1984 and 1980. Uh, his vice president through both of those terms had been George uh, H. Bush, uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush. Um, in 1989, uh, in the 1998 and 1988, I'm, I'm sorry, election, uh, George Bush Sr. or George H.W. Bush, uh, he received the Republican Party nomination and he went on to defeat David Dukakis in the 1988 election and he was sworn in, he took office in 1989. Um, in 1989, uh, 19, 1989 in and of itself was a very significant year in the history of the world. It heralded the end of the United States Civil, uh, the United States Civil Union Cold War. Largely, um, the Cold War um, disintegrated, it fell apart during this time. Um, Uh, both uh, both powers had been a uh, in this sort of like teeter totter um, stalemate, um, but with the failures of uh, of the Soviet army in Afghanistan, with the ratcheting up of the new arms race, the Soviet Union uh, was pushed to its limits and came to an end. Um, one of the more striking scenes of the Soviet of this uh, time was the image, uh, the, this, this image broadcasted globally of students joyfully demolishing the, Ber uh, the Berlin Wall. Uh, and two years um, af after that, the Soviet Union went through a very peaceful transition from communism to democracy. The Soviet uh, Union, that, that is uh, the Russian Federation, the other parts, um, uh, Particularly in the Balkans, um, uh, the, the uh, decline, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union led to uh, an, an, uh, uh, a great outpouring of bloodshed. Um, trying to pick up where I, where I left, left off. Um, okay, uh, so uh, there was a great outpouring of bloodshed and there was even an attempted counter coup within the Soviet Union to sort of forestall 
the transition from communism to democracy. Now, these sudden changes left the United States in a position of being universally viewed as the world's leading power. Um, many people viewed the United States as the only superpower. Russia, in and of itself, was still uh, in a very strong position and is still in a very regionally dominant position. It had just given up the um, the uh, expenses or the um, or the uh, national pursuit of empire, so to speak. Um, it, it, uh, it, it kept the core lands of uh, the Russian Federation, the Eurasian parts of Russia, and of course the immense uh, uh, territory of Siberia. Um, these sudden changes uh, left the United States um, uh, sort of uh, in, a, in, a, in a weird sort of position with the superpower, but it now saw that the whereas before they were only really leading the uh, the anti-communist world, they were now in a position to lead the entire world, um, and uh, and uh, and they were sort of burdened with um, sort of configuring this new global order, this new world order in which uh, these emerging nations would be uh, would, would, uh, would have to be um, put into play would have to be would have to be able to do a lot of spots and slots in this new political structure this new global political structure um, President George W. Bush stated that the United States will continue to watch over this new world order and uh, his first challenge really came in repelling the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait a challenge that the United States rose uh, to meet, um, leading to a multinational coalition of United States of United Nations forces in 1991. Now, in the, in the, in the 1990s, uh, one thing became very clear, uh, particularly in the early 1990s, that the absence of the communist uh, government's repression in many places, um, uh, formerly under the the oversight or the control of the Soviet Union, uh, the absence of communism allowed allowed uh, old ethnic and religious antagonisms that had been uh, sort of contained because of the communist uh, communistic uh, communism's uh, communist regime's repression. Those ethnic and religious antagonisms. Had never been uh, were never resolved. Uh, they flared up as soon as the hammer and the sickle, the uh, the symbols of Soviet communism, as soon as the hammer and the sickle fell down, um, the old antagonism flared up, and it resulted in a series of repugnant mass extermination campaigns. Now, the United States was hesitant at first to get involved in these disputes for fear of being trapped in another Vietnam. Now, a more elusive threat um, that, that, that threatened the United States um, was the recurring policy of terrorism. The collapse of the Soviet Union struck all Americans, uh, took, took all Americans by surprise. Many people were dumbstruck by, by the fact that the Soviet Union imploded, that it collapsed. Um, many, many people had, uh, many people and many government pro programs and policies had, uh, had been created, had, had been created, developed, and lived throughout the Cold War. Uh, for many people, the, uh, the Cold War was the only existence that they had known. Uh, and for many people who were studying the Cold War, who were studying global politics, they looked back to old Franco-Anglo antagonisms and uh, and said that there was uh, this recurring theme um, uh, and antagonism between these two had they rose and, and fell. And they, 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 uh, they, they thought that this was just, you know, the early stages of the Cold War of the showdown. They thought that the other, that the United States um, Soviet Union uh, showdown would last another two to four centuries. That, that it would be a very long, uh, a very long going indeed. Now, 
Um, now, uh, for those for those who have studied and who have theorized on the dynamics of the Soviet Union, um, they themselves had had uh, always thought that, this, uh, and particularly CIA analysts, they had always thought that the Soviet Union would have the um, the resiliency to rebound itself. And, and, and I mean, just to sort of go a, a little bit further in depth, um, between 1946 and 1949, generations of professionals had come uh, into prominence, had come into bearing and become very prominent features of, of, of United States society. Uh, the professionals were subject matter experts in, in the field of Cold War relations. They studied and they theorized on the dynamics of the Soviet Union, the United States, and global uh, sort of antagonism, global rivalries. Um, many of them look back to, uh, um, not, not really looking back deep into history, just looking at, I guess, uh, intra-Greek, um, and not even all of the intra-Greek rivalries. Um, certainly they, they weren't looking at the, uh, the, um, the, the, rivalry, the rivalry between Sparta and Argos, um, they, they looked at the rivalry with, between Sparta and Athens. Um, they certainly didn't look at any uh, rivalry between the Persians and the Greeks, or the Greeks, uh, the uh, Egyptians and the Hittites, or, um, or, or anyone else. They, they looked at uh, Sparta and Athens, or Rome and Carthage, uh, England, uh, later the uh, Great Britain, uh, later the United Kingdom, and France. Uh, and they all sort of drew conclusions based off of the, the centuries that those nations had, uh, had been uh, antagonistic towards each other. Um, and, they, and they applied those to understanding the United States and the Soviet Union's antagonisms towards each other. Um, the, uh, and had that stated earlier, the CIA had analysts. They had scores and scores of analysts um, who studied this, who analyzed this, who went over and went into great detail. Uh, many of the major universities held courses on the Soviet Union. Um, the military, of course, kept track and kept scholarly, uh, put, put in a lot of scholarly pursuit into understanding the Soviet Union, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, during the late 1980s, nobody had a clue that the whole thing was coming to an end. If you had gone to any one of the professionals in, let's say, 1985, 1986, 1987, 1988, none of them would have told you that the Soviet Union was on its last legs and that the Cold War would be over uh, but before, um, before Michael Jordan won a championship. Uh, that's an always an interesting fact that, uh, that classes and friends of mine always like to, uh, well, some of them get really angry about, but it took him about six years to win a championship. Um, uh, um, moving on, uh, uh, in the 1990s, um, the, the collapse, just, and I really can't under, uh, underscore enough just how surprised the world was by it. The prevailing view was that Russia was resilient to all forms of collapse, that no matter what happened, the Russians always rebounded, reformed, and continued. And uh, at the end of this, we can make an argument that the Russians did rebound after the fall of communism quite strongly. Um, we, we can go back to uh, the Great Northern War. Um, Russia was in a hopeless mess, and yet it had defeated Charles XII. Uh, Russia was in a hopeless mess, and yet Russia was able to defeat Napoleon. Russia was in a hopeless mess, and yet the Russians beat Hitler. Uh, the fact that Russia was in disarray, and and if you had walked up to someone and said, "Hey, you know, Russia has all these internal problems. Russia uh, just lost against the, um, the the Afghans in Afghanistan. Russia's in all these problems. Russia's going to collapse." They would have shot back with those three instances and many others, um, and said, "Russia's always in collapse. Russia's always in peril. Russian the Russian situation always seems hopeless, and yet the Russians prevail." Um, uh, they, they would have told you that just because Russia was in disarray doesn't mean that the ruling regime is going to fail. Um, somehow, 
some way, they always seem to find a way to stay afloat. They always seem to somehow um, will themselves to continue. Um, well, in, uh, an unwillable war, an unwinnable uh, war in Afghanistan had intensified hatred for the Soviet regime within the Soviet Union, uh, especially among non-ethnic populations, um, the non-ethnic Russian populations in Central Asia and Eastern Europe. In the years of the, uh, in the in the years that saw the end of the Reagan administration, a new general improvement in uh, United States Soviet Union relations brought about uh, a new nuclear weapons agreement, um, one that was signed in 1987. And of course, uh, a year later, the Soviet Union formally withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh, by 1988, the Soviet Union was crumbling from the inside. Now, the Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, he came to power and he began to undertake two new policies um, within the Soviet Union. Uh, and they were Glasnost and Perestroika. Uh, one to begin, and it, it's a Perestroika, one uh, did this one was to begin to open up access to information, making Russian society less restrictive. Um, and the other, Glasnost, was to open up uh, new economic incentives by not relying solely on a command economy, which the Soviet Union had previously relied on. Now, these policies were striking departures from the long Soviet tradition. Uh, that had been established following the 1917 revolution um, that, that uh, ushered out the, the Tsar's, um, uh, the Tsar's uh, autocracy and ushered out the uh, democratic government of the white Russians. Now, um, now the question of, of, of uh, access to information um, was perhaps the most important at the time. Uh, the Soviet government had depended on monopolizing access to information, but with the rapid development of new information sharing technologies, namely the, uh, the printer, the home printer, and the Xerox machine, it became harder and harder for them to uh, supervise and to uh, scrutinize and to uh, fully observe the sharing of information. Um, They, they were really unable to uh, stop um, the transmission of, of information uh, either using uh, miniature tape recorders or even uh, pamphlets or flyers. Um, it, it became much more certain for subversive groups, for anti-regime groups to spread information and to organize. Um, they, they, they quickly began to undermine the Iron Curtain from within. Um, a host of tech of, of, of uh, technology sharing information um, from Xerox machines, Polaroid cameras, personal computers, uh, the miniature tape recorders that I spoke of, they all made it more difficult for the Soviet regime to monopolize information. Um, just to give a, a quick example, Soviet dissenters, uh, before the technologies came uh, into, the, into play, Soviet dissenters would have to hand copy or type documents for dissemination requiring a lot of time and effort, a lot of coordination. Um, whereas dissenters in the United States and, and later Soviet dissenters, they were able to mass produce documents with ease in a relatively short amount of time using Xerox machines, uh, personal printers, um, and, uh, and of course, uh, they were able to share um, uh, images via Polaroid cameras and they were able to share uh, speeches. Uh, they were able to, uh, to share words, um, uh, spoken words, much more easier with the, with the use of uh, miniature tape, uh, tape um, miniature uh, tape, uh, tape cassettes. Um, this all resulted in a lot of unrest in, uh, in the Soviet states. Uh, 
Uh, for example, in Poland, uh, the then sitting Pope John Paul II was an ethnic Pole. Um, he was the spiritual godfather of the Solidarity Movement, which began uh, as a dock workers movement in Gdansk, but quickly became a national movement of opposition uh, against the Soviet regime. In 1989, the regime collapsed and the Soviet Union had, which had to withdraw from Afghanistan, had to withdraw from Eastern Europe, and more, uh, has more and more of its infrastructure disintegrated under this new, under this, uh, this new threat, under, under this new challenge. Now, Gorbachev announced to the world uh, that the individual nations of the Soviet Union would be allowed to decide for themselves their own future. This is a, a sort of play on the national destiny or on national determination. Poland took the lead almost immediately and established a non-communist government the next summer. Hungary and East Germany, they began to slowly reestablish dip diplomatic relations with the West. Hungary reestablishing relations with Austria and East Germany reestablishing relationships uh, relations with, um, with, with West Germany. Um, now, the central figure uh, in, in all of this and the most famous monument associated with all of this was the very real, the very literal Berlin Wall. The wall has served as uh, the inspiration for some of the more memorable moments of the Cold War, such as the Berlin Airlift, um, the Ike in Berliner speech that John Kennedy made, the I Am a Donut speech, uh, and of course uh, there was the tense standoff um, at the wall itself as armed guards would be there to prevent people from defecting and to also just stand guard to uh, the menace to, uh, to let the opponents know that, that there was a uh, military forces stationed on, uh, on the other side of the city and that they uh, that, that they would act if necessary. Um, the wall, um, in 19, uh, 1989, the wall was, uh, was, uh, torn down. A, a crowd gathered, a crowd began to form, and a festive party-like atmosphere developed as the wall was demolished, was, was torn away piece by piece. Um, in, in the old, uh, now, Soviet, uh, now, the President George H.W. Uh, Bush, President Bush Sr., he welcomed the transition to democracy in the old Soviet Union. Uh, he was careful not to antagonize the former Soviet Union or the former Soviet states. Uh, he was keen to look for ways to shore up and support the new democracies. Now, Reagan's supporters immediately began to launch a... Uh, uh, a campaign to have it acknowledged that with Ronald Reagan's foreign policy more than anything else that was the key instrument in the, in the demise of the Soviet Union. Um, Reagan supporters argued then and they still argue now that his belligerence towards the Soviet Union put so much strain on the Soviet Union that that, that, that it could not last, that, that, that it just imploded under the weight of of uh, Ronald Reagan's um, projections. Now, while the Soviet Union was uh, making a peaceful transition to democracy, the Chinese were thwarting efforts to democratize China. In China, the government repressed the movement, uh, a movement of uh, students um, that was much stronger uh, and more unified um, than the Soviet Union's had been. And, and, and this was because the central government, the communist government in China was much more stronger, much more unified than the communist government in Soviet Russia. Um, China hadn't been in any major, major wars. They had uh, aided the Vietnamese in their struggle. They had gone to war against the Vietnamese after the Vietnamese began to uh, display imperialistic tendencies. They had gone to war in support of the uh, communist regime in North Korea. Um, and now, and now uh, they they were uh, firmly in control of their country, and they um, had, had communism was uh, was collapsing in, in Eastern Europe. They were strengthening them, themselves there. Um, the Bush administration 
was on uh, one hand eager to see democracy spread to China, but on the other hand, um, it, it was uneager, it was not really eager to jeopardize um, trade relations with China or, or diplomatic relations with China. They wanted to see the, the, the transition that was occurring in Eastern Europe uh, also occur in East Asia, but it, it just, uh, but they weren't really will, willing to interfere directly in Chinese national affairs to do so. The collapse of communism was, in Eastern Europe was still an astonishing world development and, and, uh, and, and still the reaction, the, the, uh, the reaction, the careful stepping uh, to not flee, to not uh, antagonize the populations there was still a, a great move, a great achievement for uh, George H.W. Bush's administration. Now, in, uh, in Eastern Europe um, and, and uh, in, the, in the United States, you know, generations had grown up, had been born and raised during this era, and had really come to uh, expect it to continue indefinitely. The idea that it was end that that it was ending was really alien to most people, uh, and a world uh, a world that was for that was now for the first time since 1945 free of the threat of a nuclear war was both uh, titillating uh, and enthralling, inciting, and and, and uh, exciting but also was met with a bit of pessimism, you know. Uh, many thought that, well, we survived the, uh, the, the concept of a nuclear war. What now do we have to be afraid of? I mean, something worse is gonna come surely. Um, many were disappointed with the end of the Cold War. Uh, from the United States point of view, developments were highly favorable. Uh, the Republic was left unweakened and, and uh, was left uh, looking much like the only superpower in the world. Uh, the first test of the new geopolitical realignment was the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Uh, and this occurred under the, uh, the rule of Iraqi strongman Saddam Hussein. Iraq had recently emerged from a long, bloody war with Iran, a war that raged all through the 1980s, and it was at the, at this time uh, a very sensible foreign policy plan to supply the Iraqi army with uh, munitions and supplies. Uh, because again, Iran was a former enemy, a former foe. In the 1980s, we're still uh, looking at Iran with suspicion and many people still had very hardened attitudes towards Iran for the Iranian revolution and of course the hostage crisis uh, um, that, that, that really plagued the last year of the Carter administration. Now, uh, Kuwait uh, supplied nearly one fifth of all oil imported into the United States and was of strategic importance to the United States um, domestically and militarily. Uh, furthermore, the Bush administration took the position that medium sized nations were not to be allowed to terrorize uh, or, or, or seek to expand their holdings by picking on or absorbing their smaller, uh, smaller sized neighbors. Now, the choice was made to quickly intervene uh, to set an international precedent to curtail the eruption of minor wars of conquest by aspirant empires. Um, at first, the United States with strong backing from the uh, well, with uh, strong backing from the United Nations, uh, imposed economic sanctions against Iraq, um, and, and these sanctions didn't yield any sort of result, uh, negative or positive. Um, they, they they simply were imposed, and uh, Iraq continued its invasion and occupation of Kuwait. Um, the United Nations. Uh, then began to organize a force to be led by the United States um, to compel to, to compel via force of arms the Iraqis to withdraw from Kuwait. Uh, beginning on January 15, 1991, um, the United Nations began to conduct air raids on Iraq and occupied Kuwait. Uh, which did not, and, and again, the air raids, much like air raids and air campaigns do, didn't really lead to any sort of uh, Iraqi withdrawal, didn't lead to any sort of change of hearts, change of attitude. Uh, the air raids were, were quickly followed then 
by ground force invasion of Kuwait on February 24th, 1991, uh, which later led to an, uh, an invasion of Iraq, which very rapidly led to a checkmating of Iraqi ground forces and the entire affair came to a decisive end um, in a United Nations victory. Uh, the United States for the time uh, for, for the time um, in combat uh, the, the United States did something really kind of um, really kind of unique really something kind of new what the United States did what they employed smart bombs uh, that that is bombs that were guided by radar that made strategic bombing more effective and heralded in this new phase in techno technological warfare and high-tech warfare um, and it really sort of gave this image of undisputed techno technological achievement to the United States uh, the Iraqis really didn't have anything to compare to it uh, and with that we'll break here um, we'll come back and we'll finish off this lecture as always hit like subscribe and comment let me know what you thought about this lecture uh, I am Ted, and I'll see you guys next time for another lecture.